All right, hey y'all. So this is my first uh, piece of like consolidated video content for the s12k.com blog. And I'm really excited to be sort of presenting it and putting it out there in the world. Um, as always, you can sort of follow along with other pieces of content and other things that I've made. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter or at the website, which is s12k.com. There'll be links for that uh, in the description. Uh, not a problem at all. I'm trying to do the YouTube thing, so maybe you could follow this too. I'm not sure yet. Uh, I'm going to figure it out, I promise. I just am so stoked to share this conversation with y'all. It's with my friends Steve and Emily, and they work at uh, Zapier and GitLab, respectively, and they're just so brilliant. Like, this kind of conversation goes so easily and goes so naturally with such excellent conversationalists who have such great ideas. And we talk about career career paths in data and analytics. We talk about like what are data ops, like why are they so important? Why are they having kind of a moment right now? And we talk about kind of communication and what it means to work in a remote organization. So if all of those sound good, uh, watch this whole video. Otherwise, I'm gonna break it up into like chunks for each of those topics as well. So if you want something a little bit smaller, uh, it's there for you. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Okay, awesome. So welcome, Emily, Stephen, super stoked um, to be having this conversation right now. This is the first sort of new format conversation like this. I'm really excited to have it. Uh, we've got a whole list of things to get through. And I think probably the best way to start is just with a little bit of an intro, sort of say who you are, where you're working, and sort of like what the, what the shape of your work is. Um, Emily, would you like to start us off? Sure, my name's Emily Sherio. I've been at GitLab for almost two years now. I joined originally as the first data analyst, moved into a data engineering role, and now I'm in a I'm an internal strategy consultant on the chief of staff team. Um, and I live on the east coast of the US in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, GitLab is 1,200 team members today across 65 countries around the world. So we don't have an office, we're all remote. Uh, and we are building a single application for the entire software development lifecycle. That's awesome. Steven? So I'm Steven. I work at Zapier, which is a workflow automation platform that connects 2,000 of the SaaS apps that you use every day and lets you automate tasks and workflows between them. I also started on the data team as our first marketing analyst a little over two years ago and have since moved into a sort of business operations, special projects type role where I essentially work on either projects that are super cross-functional across the organization where it doesn't fit neatly under a single executive or VP or projects that are extremely important and under-resourced for a particular period of time. So I can spin up really quickly, be 80% as effective as a real employee doing that job <laughs> and be able to fill holes around the org when we need it. So it kind of sounds like you're both in, at least to my mind, kind of non-traditional data positions. Are these positions you were like hired into or are these positions that sort of grew around your particular skill set? Like what's the, what's the origin story there? Yeah, Stephen has a more interesting one. So <laughs> I do have a pretty good one here. So I started at Zapier because I cold emailed the CEO and said, I think you need a chief of staff or a business operations person. Here's what that means. Here's why it would be good for you. And here's why I would be good at it. And he emailed me back and essentially said, I don't think I need that, but I liked your email, so let's talk anyways. <laughs> and as we talked, he realized that my background was really in data. And so I started on the data team, but he knew that this type of role was where I wanted to take my career. And so both my CEO and my manager at the time, the head of the data team, were both uh, very good at feeding me projects that fit this vein, even when I was sitting on the data team. Mm -hmm. And as Zapier grew from around probably 50 or 75 people, when I sent that first email to 200 to 250 to over 300, Wade came back around and sort of said, okay, now I see those problems that you were originally describing. Let's give it a shot and officially move me over into a role like this. Cool. Yeah, the way I describe the transition is that data went from being my job to being something I used to do my job. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, you know, we op opened a chief of staff rec, um, and this is one of the roles that reports to the chief of staff. So I've been, uh, we're still hiring a chief of staff, mm -hmm. uh, 
but I've been kind of doing it in the interim. Um, and that's how my mindset has changed. And really I've come to realize what a superpower data is sure. where you don't have to ask the data team for the thing. You can just like go write the SQL query yourself or go make the MR yourself. And, um, it allows me to get what I need much more efficiently. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense to me. Yeah. It's similar vein. The way I position this, um, I actually just made the first hire to work in business operations other than myself. And so the way that we were talking about this through the interview process was that you should be the most data savvy person in the room when there's no data team member in the room. Mm -hmm. So we have a high expectation that people can self-serve and do a lot of data in order to work in a hyper cross-functional role at a data forward organization like ours. But you don't necessarily have to have been qualified to write Python and R stuff that would get you a role on our data team. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. And it sounds like y'all have found like a pretty significant amount of leverage and a significant amount of success kind of in these deeply cross-functional roles. So far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah it's, I think um, it can, I was feeling like, I was doing really well in the data team. I was really confident in what I was doing. I have opinions and, and a mindset on how things should be approached and problems to, to be solved. Um, and I had like a bank of patterns that I could refer to whenever a, a problem came up. And transitioning from that to the role I'm in now, I don't have that bank of patterns anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So every problem is new and it's creating a new pattern that I'm gonna refer to in the future. But in the meantime, it's just, hard and exciting and you know thrilling all at the same time right and, um, i i think objectively yeah i'm doing a good job i can pull my own analysis and solve the problem but even more exciting is that like the role itself is just so intriguing it it sounds a little bit like having folks who are um you know really data literate and sort of more than data literate like data query like literate outside of the data organization in some ways can reduce stress for people in the data organization totally. because it's not as though the work that you're doing didn't exist right before before you were around to do it yeah we actually position this not just in my role but some other places in the org i would say one of the goals for our data team is actually to empower at least one power user mm -hmm. inside of every organization at the company and on the teams that have that we see that person able to carry the 80 percent of data questions that are easily accessible easily self-servable and when those don't have to go through the data org the entire company can operate much faster because right. the data org gets to sit on the questions that actually require a deeper level of sophistication or technical skill um, or just thought processes. And so when you have those power users around the rest of the organization, it's extremely helpful for the data team. Yeah, I can see that. So let me ask, one, one of the things that has sort of been kicking around on uh, you know, uh, analytics Twitter and sort of the data social ecosystem has been this idea of career progress and like career ladders and like what it means to succeed or advance as a professional, like in the data world in 2020. And I was wondering sort of how that's resonating with y'all, especially sort of given the almost like branching nature of your own pathways. Yeah, Caitlin Mormon's post on this, I thought was really great. So absolutely opportunity to give her a shout out, like the, I think it was a three part series and they were really phenomenal reads. Um, I don't know what this, role means for my career like yeah i did not if you had asked me eight months ago um i've been in this role now for almost six months um if you'd asked me eight months ago like you, do you see yourself being outside of the data team i would have hard node right. that idea uh i i don't think I think some people find comfort in a career ladder and in, in like being able to know what, like here's the next five or 10 year plan. And I, the approach that I'm taking is like, I know where I want to be in 15 years sure. and there are lots of routes to get there. And so I'm just going to say yes to opportunities that bring me closer to that. Um, and that may or may not be in the data team. Uh, and that changes how I think about what next steps
stats are or should sure. be. Um, but it's just like, I have my North Star metric and I know what success looks like and there are lots of ways to get there. I don't need a, a clearly laid out plan. Sure. That doesn't work for everyone. And right. so if you want to be like the greatest data engineer there ever was, a career ladder is a great way to measure yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in my experience, so you heard from my original story of how I got this job, I sort of had a target for this job <laughs> and was taking steps to make that happen. Right. Uh, but at Zapier, it has definitely, we've actually transitioned over the last two years or so to having more structured career framework, growth framework, career ladder type material. And I do find that helpful, even as someone who is prone to jumping around broadly, there are still skills that you need in leadership that are descriptive enough, no matter where in the organization you are, data team or otherwise, and having those skills explicitly labeled as things that the company values, I think is super important. And Zapier does a really good job of having a framework that has parallel pathing for ICs and management tracks. And that has also been really valuable in my opinion, because it lets you see how you might advance doing something like an IC role. You're obviously going to tend towards leadership in the sense of people respecting your opinion and having more sway over decisions and that type of thing, regardless of which path you take as you get more senior. But there are skills of how to leverage that expertise that you can advance in and actually make a significant difference for the business. And so I think because management has sort of more well-defined leadership qualities that are mandatory, people mm -hmm. associate leadership and management quite closely, but there are plenty of leaders who are not necessarily managers and having an explicit track for the people who want to take that path is super valuable. And so you can do that inside of the data org. You could be a really sophisticated analyst. You could either be really technically good. You could be really good at communicating with stakeholders. All of those things make you more valuable to the business and should be reflected in the sort of level of your career that you are in. But you don't have to go straight down a management path or head of the data team or data team manager in order to advance. And I think that's important for everyone. It, it feels like right now, sort of the, the idea of analysis and, and sort of data organizations is, is really feeling kind of turbulent to me. Um, it feels like job titles that used to mean something really specific maybe are starting to mean something new. We're seeing really like data heavy roles emerge outside of the data organization. We're seeing like really this like um, hybrid sort of role. I think of the analytics engineer as sort of this like really new space. And I wonder if the sort of recent surge of interest in formal career ladders is in some way related to like the, the sort of professional turbulence that, that we're observing. I have a really great question. <laughs> yeah, I, because I actually offer some career coaching and I like talking to people about career and pathing and all of that sort of thing. So I think about this a lot. And one of the, conclusions that I have drawn over the last year or so is I wish there was a little bit more clarity in data titles and they are evolving, but I have sort of my wish list of what I, th what I think those titles should mean. But there's problems in that if you take a specific title, data scientist being the classic one probably over the last five years, yeah. there are three or four or five specific distinct roles that get sort of lumped into a data scientist title, mm -hmm. but the data scientist title is likely the one that gets comped the highest of any of those things. Right. And so you have a very personal incentive to go for a data scientist title from a purely compensation perspective, regardless of whether that reflects accurately the work that you're actually doing. Right. And you can make a really strong argument that, hey, at this other company, that's a data scientist title, so it should be a data scientist title here, which means I should get higher comp. And that, from a career progression and sort of coaching perspective, I encourage people to lean into because I right. think you deserve to go get whatever you can get in terms of compensation and benefits and things like that. But from a company perspective and from a job hunting clarity perspective, I really wish that the titles would settle a little bit and people would understand 
exactly what the job is that they are applying for or looking for. Mm -hmm. I, I think too, there's something to be said that across the board titles are hard. We probably just see it really obviously in the data space, but I mean, oh, yeah. my title's internal strategy consultant. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh. titles, titles are hard. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I think it's probably across the board hard. Uh, I, I think the question of like, are career ladders and titles related? Yeah, that's, that makes a ton of sense to me. Um, but titles across the board are hard. And we see it a lot with data scientists. I think that is the canonical example because at some orgs, data scientists are data analysts. Yeah, and yeah. at some orgs, they're machine learning engineers. Yeah, um, yeah. But across the board, I, th I think like the root answer here is titles are hard. Yeah, I can definitely lean into that. Over the last two years, my titles have been special projects and executive team program manager. So neither of those are particularly descriptive and they certainly don't do the same thing across different organizations. So I certainly have that struggle even in a personal level. Yeah, for sure. It, it feels like it really does a disservice to applicants as well. Um, hiring for analytics roles at wordpress.com has been really tricky because the baseline sort of technical competence that's required to succeed in the role, I think is not consistent with most of the other job titles, which are exactly the same, right? To be a data analyst elsewhere, I think is, can be a very different experience. And so we end up just having to reject a lot of people out of hand. And that kind of feels bad. <laughs> um, and I imagine it probably feels bad on, on their side too. Sure. Yeah, we found that a lot when we were hiring for a data analyst, uh, where at some companies, data analyst means really good at Excel. Yeah. At GitLab, it means you can work from the command line and you know what a cron job is and you're going to write dbt sql and understand jinja and for loops and those are different data analysts yeah job titles are hard <laughs> yeah, you, you summed it up you got it yeah totally so talk to me about about data ops um this is a term and i think it has a meaning um but i'm not sure like what it is um it feels important um, do y'all feel like you do data ops? Not in my current role. I think yeah. I feel I am much more passionate today about uh, the importance of data ops as someone sitting outside of the data team because sure. now I need that number. I pull up that chart and it's broken or it's not working or the numbers are just wrong. Uh, now my job isn't to fix those things anymore. I need that to do the rest of my job. Um, I think of data ops as the processes by which a data team improves cycle time uh, and improves data reliab reliability and data quality mm -hmm. um, and data integrity as part of that. And I think this manifests in a couple different ways, but the big three that I point to is um, working in with a single source of truth and, and version controlled data practices. Um, so mostly working out of a repo, uh, working with a change management system using merge requests or pull requests and having testing on your data because then the data team can catch problems before they make it out to the end user. So on my side, Zapier actually spun out a specific data ops organization. Hmm. And our org structure is a little bit different than you would sort of typically expect a data organization to have, I think. But one of the benefits is understanding lanes of ownership and that can be super helpful as long as the relationship across those silos is really good. Mm -hmm. And at least for now, that is still the case because the data team sort of split in two, one on the data engineering side. So the data engineering side has data ops, data warehouse engineers, data engineers, and then the decision science and analytics side, which has what we call decision scientists and other people might call data analysts or analytics engineers or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
with that split has come a little bit of clarity on what parts of the pipeline do different people own and when someone else notices a problem you have the idea of who to go to who's responsible for that and that's been helpful for sure but we are definitely not yet a world-class organization in terms of data reliability or any of that material mm -hmm. at the moment it still definitely requires potentially someone like me noticing that hey this number's out of date or you're missing three days in the middle of december or something like that where we actually have probably a suite of 100 or 200 tests and there's still a bunch of stuff that ends up slipping yeah. and so i think data ops is not new like this this function has been around as long as SQL you know, databases. This is not like a new function. It would be naive of us to think just because we're doing it in a slightly different way in the cloud, that sort of thing, that we are fundamentally treading new ground. But I do think that as data has become more accessible and self-serve tooling has become better, that the importance of data ops only increases because there are more people looking at it. It's, mistakes are more visible inside the org and that it, it's really meaningful for people to make sure that when they make an assumption based on a set of data that they looked at, that that data is accurately portrayed. What, um, what is your sense of what it would mean to be a world-class organization in, in terms of data ops? That is a great question. And I am not 100% sure that very many people nail it. I've seen a bunch of anecdotes around analytics slack analytics twitter where even the organizations that you think of as sort of being amazing in this space in particular i'm thinking of facebook where they have a ton of data and you would expect that they if anyone is good at this they're good at this right but there are jokes that flow around the twitter sphere of you know an excel file named data v7 final x3 <laughs> and that's not great practice either right, so they're right. just making it work as much as the rest of us um, if somebody out there has really nailed this and feels super confident that they are doing it right i would love to hear from them yeah yeah it's interesting to me that you thought of facebook because i thought of airbnb oh it's a good one why airbnb i don't know i guess that's that's just the one that popped into my head. I've been following their engineering blog for a long time. Yeah. Great blog. Yeah. I don't, I guess I don't think of Airbnb as an organization doing data ops. I think of them as definitely like data driven and, and it seems like they've got their data science stuff really sort of buttoned up. And I guess maybe a little bit data ops when it's working properly is sort of invisible behind, behind all that. Am I wrong to remember that Airflow actually came out of Airbnb and their data engineering org. That sounds familiar to me. I think Superset came out of, out of their work as well, right? Possible. So they're definitely at the forefront of some of this material. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh, Airflow came out of Airbnb engineering in June, 2015. Wow. That's where that comes from in my head. Good for them. Yeah. We use it. <laughs> yeah, we do too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Airbnb is the first that pops into my head. Netflix is the second. Netflix. Sure. Yeah. Netflix is a good one, right? With all the recommendation and just the, I mean, they, I, I wonder, I wonder how much of when we think about sort of, cause I, I still think, I mean, I recognize data ops is something that has existed in organizations for a long time, but really sort of talking about it in the explicit way that we're talking about it now, I think is still a little bit on the new side. And I wonder how much of really successful data ops right now is just being like close to people doing really excellent DevOps, right? Because you think about Airbnb and Netflix, those are both companies that have to handle just an enormous amount of development and must have excellent practices behind it. And I wonder how much of, how much of this can be sort of chalked up to adjacency, right? Just sort of good fortune. Yeah, I also might turn the table on you all uh, because the question that I have that's related to this is how does it play with B2C versus B2B? And a lot of the times when you're thinking about huge data engineering recommendation in particular practices, you're thinking of Amazon with just an 
amazing amount of B2C data, right. where in any B2B space, you are considerably more limited. And so your data infrastructure doesn't have to hold up to the quite the scale that a huge B2C organization does. Mm -hmm. And so it's possible that the ones that we think of, like you're mentioning, that have these amazing DevOps organizations because of their natural B2C distribution engine, um, that B2B companies like Emily and I work at may not have had to scale to that point, even right. though we're relatively large from a B2B tech startup sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. It does feel like, it, you know, they're probably related. I mean, who, who's to say? Um, well, although kind of interestingly, I, I mean, it is worth exploring too that sort of the primary customer of excellent data ops is internal, right? Like it's y'all, it's C-suite, it's product, it's marketing. Whereas sort of the, the folks who benefit ostensibly from excellent DevOps are like the eventual customer, right? And I think in a lot of organizations, it's really hard to get motivated and get resourced to serve purely internal customers. Mm -hmm. um, has that been y'all's experience or no? I can think very specifically of some internal tooling that if it breaks once a month or once every other week, if it's an internal customer, maybe that's fine. And that person has to wait an hour or two for something to reload or some sort of bug to be fixed. Whereas if that were delivered to an external customer, that would never fly. So there's definitely a trade-off in terms of prototype versus productionized equipment and reliability concerns that as you start to serve external customers with recommendation maybe being the primary case where the data org most obviously can serve customers, you have to build in way better reliability and fallbacks when you start to drift in that direction than when you're serving internally. When it's 100% right. internal tooling, I think you're totally spot on that it's just hard to justify the V2, V3, V4 work to make things super stable that it would take when the benefit of it is internal only. Yeah. It's an 80-20 thing, right? Totally. Classic. <laughs> So let me let me let's talk a little bit more about about what it means for sort of a data team, a data collection, a data division to like operate successfully within the bigger organization, right? Especially as folks who have sort of both worked inside and sort of outside of what you think of as like the traditional data org. Like how how do you think this is done really well? Like how is that how is value communicated outside of that org? Um, how do you see people like failing to find great success in that in that space? Yeah, I, so one thing I, I think a lot about, uh, there, we have a data channel in Slack and occasionally rather than opening our BI tool and like searching for a chart, people just ask in the data channel, like, hey, does this exist or does anything like this exist? And I think that there's a like education slash democratization slash awareness piece that like you want to build a muscle in people that like hey i want data to make this decision mm -hmm. you know because they've been working without it to some point so the first piece is oh i want additional information to make this decision and then the next piece is like knowing where to go um and that's that movement from like posting in a slack channel to knowing to search in the bi tool that's one yeah. piece Totally. We have a similar phenomenon, which I don't think is surprising, but one of the biggest improvements in this that I think has helped the most for us over the last year is we built out what we call our data golden path. So there's a series of stages, basically five levels, that is a course in data at level one and then Zapier data at later, at later levels. And being able to take the people most likely to come to the data channel to ask those questions and say, hey, 
if you take this golden path set of courses, you will be able to answer these yourself, I promise, is super powerful. Mm -hmm. It happened to me yesterday where someone came in and was asking a set of questions. They're brand new. They haven't seen this material yet. They're asking extremely smart questions about data at Zapier. And I answered the first two because they took one minute each. And then when she asked something more difficult, I said, hey, we have this golden path. You're the type of person who's clearly going to benefit from it. Dedicate a day or two of your onboarding time to going through that and it will pay back dividends over time for sure. Yeah. And that has been extremely powerful. So we have plans actually to make that even get a little bit deeper. And as I mentioned earlier, I think having a power user that's done that material who you can count on in every team in the organization just is so amazing for the data team. And that golden path has probably been our biggest success down that road um, in the last two or three years. Can you share what those other levels are? I don't remember exactly offhand. Um, they're documented. I don't remember which pieces we split out, but essentially it starts with sort of data concepts. Um, some that are simple, correlation is not causation. Yeah. Some that are much more complicated, like don't peek at your experiments. And so there's, those are in different levels of the golden path and sort of the level of complexity. But then there are also just straight up lessons on here's this particular data set, the user's data set at Zapier, and here's how you ask questions about user data. And here is a second lesson on how you ask questions about usage data at Zapier. And those are in separate tables, separate explorers and looker. Mm -hmm. And here are the most common questions that you might ask of each of those. And so for the primary five or so most used exploration features in looker, we actually document, here's what these tables are. This is how you ask it questions. Here's how you do something slightly more complicated. And so, then there are SQL lessons of if you want to go extra deep and you really want to be that power user and be able to explore stuff that hasn't been pre-baked for you, sure. intro to SQL, intro to Zapier table structure and things like that. And then we actually have plans for levels four and five, which are not totally baked yet, but will potentially even go so far as to be a leverage point for someone, say, who wants to transfer out of whatever part of the org they are in, into the data team. That's a good way to get, you know, an L1 or an L2 person inside of the data org where we might be able to hire internally instead of externally. So I think that's a cool sort of long-term vision for that program. But I think that those first three or four levels that we already have are, have been super effective in building data usage and comfort outside of the data org mm. at the company. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like the goal of this education or advocacy isn't to eliminate questions, but to sort of improve, improve them, right? Sort of start to have much more nuanced and much more developed um, sort of conversations with your stakeholders. That's totally correct. Both for two reasons. One, they can answer easy questions themselves. The canonical example of this, in my opinion, is how many signups did we get last week? That's like the most obvious question. It's one of the easiest to self-serve and that, question just shouldn't come to the data team. The, you, it's clear, you know that it's right, you know when it's wrong, you should be able to self-serve that. Mm -hmm. Then when you get questions on the data team, they are often more nuanced, there are actually places where people are blocked. I know that if one of my power users comes to the data team and says, hey, I don't know how to answer this question, that it's probably pretty hard and might not even be self-servable in Looker. And if that's the case, then you absolutely have to come to the data team and they will help you prioritize and work on that material, hopefully to make it self-servable in the future. But when we know who those people are, it's been really helpful. And we even, in our data triage, have started attaching the data golden path level of the person asking the question. Oh. And so we have very explicitly said that if you are in a later stage golden path, that we will prioritize your questions first with the assumption that they are better questions. Hmm. If I'm understanding correctly, you're saying that your power users throughout the org are doing all the reporting so that your decision science team can work on insights. 
that's totally the goal. It's not 100%. Obviously, I don't think that'll ever be 100% true, but yeah. that is definitely what we are trying to influence in this behavior. That's awesome. Yeah, that split between sort of what you might think of as like data services and data products, I think is a cause of a lot of um, sort of communication failures or consternation between a data org and, and the rest of the organization. Um, yeah, and that's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, actually, is how do you, as a member of the data organization, like how do I communicate the different like flavors of value that the organization is, is sort of generating? Because some are pretty obvious, right? And others, like data ops work, is most valuable when it's invisible, which is kind of tricky to talk about. And I wonder sort of what advice y'all might have for me. It's hard. So the context that I would bring into this conversation is I help run our company wide OKR process and even setting goals for these support type organizations. So things like the data team in general, but data ops specifically, SRE, reliability engineers, QA engineering, all of those types of supporting functions are quite difficult to set business outcome focused key results for. Right. And so we, at least this year, have mostly tried to attach those supporting teams to the teams that are producing business outcome focused results and say that if you are supporting those teams, you are tied to the success of those teams. You need to be, you need to understand what you can do to help them work faster because they are shipping the results that matter for the business. But that can be a little bit demoralizing of my team's not doing something that matters for the business or something okay. along those lines. Right. And so I definitely don't think that we have nailed this yet either, um, except to say that you need to be, you need to have a focus on business outcome, customer outcomes, you know, what are you doing right for your customer? And even as a member of the data org, you are working in support of the people who are delivering value for customers. And as good or as bad as your internal tooling is, if you are delivering great value for your customers and the teams that you are supporting are doing that, then you are succeeding. Mm -hmm. Emily, do you have any, any thoughts? No, I think Stephen nailed it. Yeah, it really got it. <laughs> right on. Thank you so much. I'm wondering if if there's anything that um that y'all might want to talk about or or bring up. Kind of we're closing in on the on the end of our time, so I don't wanna I don't wanna butt out any any burning questions that you might have. The one thing I'll point out is the three of us tend to work or we do work for uh, very large remote organizations, all remote. Yeah, we do. Yeah. And uh, I think there's something there's probably a thread to pull there. Yeah. How does, how is communication different? Or how much harder is it to build something like a data golden path when you can't run a in-person session once a month? Yeah, I mean, I am a big, big advocate uh, for remote work in a, um, in a super like uh, universal way. I think um, it could be a source for good in the world. I think it could be a source of, uh, increasing economic equality. Um, there's a lot of reasons I think to be really enthusiastic about remote work. Um, and I am really enthusiastic about it, but I think there are a lot of, um, I think there are a lot of advantages that you get for free in a co-located work environment that many times are invisible and overlooked when people move into the remote space. Um, and a lot of those, are things that are not necessarily naturally valued by people who want to work for software companies. So things like um, having a best friend or like engaging in chit chat, right? These things that come kind of naturally in a, in a co-located environment have to be like weirdly intentional in a remote environment, right? Like you have to say to somebody like, hey, we should both eat lunch at the same time, but like watch each other eat lunch. Like <laughs> we should do that on camera, you know? And that's, I, my voice even sounds creepy saying that, right? It, <laughs> it, it, feels, it feels odd to ask that, but it wouldn't be weird at all if you were like, hey, let's get lunch today, right? Yeah. To someone in an office. And I think that- Or 
such a challenge. Let's set up a calendar invite to eat lunch and watch each other doing it every six weeks. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. And, and that, that's just one example. I think there's many places and, and ways where we, we sort of, um, we lack those little invisible, especially social, but also professional mm, interactions. And we don't even notice they're gone. We just sort of notice, you know, a lot of folks report remote work feels really lonely, right? And I think that's part of it is these like invisible things you get for free in an office and you don't even really notice they're missing. You just notice that, you know, you feel kind of lonely <laughs> and um, it's hard. I have so many thoughts here <laughs> because it's something, again, that I am also super passionate about. Yeah. I actually have a blog post that will go up hopefully this week or next on this topic specifically. But in general, it's interesting for the three of us as remote only organizations to see what we have been intentional about building. And when I talk about remote work at Zapier, I talk very specifically about how we have a written documentation culture that would never have organically developed if you were co-located yeah. because you need to be able to serve people who might be in different time zones or communicate with people who uh, you just can't tap on the shoulder. And because of that, at 300 people, so I work for the smallest company of the three here, <laughs> at 300 people, we have more written documentation, I think, than a company of a thousand that were co-located. Yeah. And so we're running into challenges now around organizational uh, knowledge and sort of institutional knowledge and how do you search for that? How do you know what information is in what tool? But the fact that it, all that information is there and accessible and you can go see why a decision was made two mm -hmm. years ago is crazy powerful. And so it's, we have made very intentional decisions to empower remote work in ways that I think transitioning a company would be much more difficult to try and build those habits later. Um, the other example that I think is fun of the material that Simon was talking about is in a role like mine that often is called chief of staff or something along those lines, a lot of the literature that you read will talk about sneaker net. You should just be able to walk around the office and talk to people and say, hey, what's on your mind? And so sneaker net at a remote organization for me literally means reaching out on Slack and saying, hey, I'd love to chat sometime and see how you're doing. But that feels much more formal mm -hmm. than tapping someone on the shoulder at lunch or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And so I've had to think hard about how do you frame that conversation? How do you help people engage with you because my role is no one's boss. So it's not exactly a skip level. It's not a formal communication, mm -hmm. but I am someone that they can talk to who has really broad context around the organization and can be super helpful for them. And so understanding how to frame that ask at a remote org has been a challenge. And I've been happy with the results when I've been able to do that. And it's actually something that I schedule regularly now, yeah. but I actually have to put it on my calendar of, Hey, let's go have three chats with random people around the org this week. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you could just do naturally as a leader at a co-located right. organization. If, yeah, if that's, that's right. And it's that, like, it feels like that forced intentionality. It just feels uh, a bit odd or a bit unnatural. And even like as a, even as a team lead, I, I find I will sometimes talk about human relationships in a way that I, I feel like I'm a, like an AI, like just trying to explore the organization sometimes. Like I've said to people on my team, like, that sounds like a really good idea. I think you should develop that relationship. Like you should talk to that person six more times. And it's just, <laughs> like see it in Slack is like, I feel like I'm not passing a Turing test or something. Like that. You know, it's, it, it's a really weird, it's very strange. Even now, like seven years in, I still feel odd sometimes thinking about it. Yeah, I, I, there are definitely trade-offs when it comes to remote work. Like I remember when I first, uh, like I was, I had just moved to a new city, I was working remotely full time, um, and my now husband was gone for a week. And I remember like three days in just having this thought of like, wow, I haven't spoken to anyone in person in three days. Yeah. And that's when I joined the gym. And I've been going to the gym three to four days a week ever since in small group classes because that's my like social interaction. Um, and that's what I need to do to be successful. And I think part of the transition to remote work um, is learning what those 
boundaries or bumpers for you are. So that's one of them for me, having coffee chats with my colleagues on a recurring basis. And I send the calendar invite and just making a recurring invite every yeah. six weeks. That's like the sweet spot for me of yeah. like, if we need to interact more often for work, we will, but this is a good regular touch point twice a quarter. Um, we have a, a really, um, I want to call it incredible, but I'm totally biased handbook at GitLab. I was going to call that out. Yeah. I was, Stephen was saying <laughs> the import of documentation. I was like, you know, I thought we were doing a good job on documentation <laughs> until I looked at GitLab's like handbook one time and yeah. I've coveted yeah. it. I'm so covetous. It's, it's really incredible. So about docgitlab.com slash handbook for anyone who wants to go see what that looks like. It's a 3,000 pages last I checked, but it's been a while since I checked. So that could be out of date. Um, but I think like I just took over certain parts of the board meeting process in my role and I didn't have to like spend a lot of time with the CFO to understand the process because it was all documented in the handbook and I could just kind of run with that. And I had a clarifying question and then I updated the handbook so that the next time this happens, I don't have that clarifying question again. Um, and I think that's like a, a really epitomizes like how great this is. Cause the alternative is I would have needed what an hour at least of the CFO's time. And right. now I didn't need that. And it, 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 I mean, it's very easy for me to see it as like marvelous from the outside, but it also seems to me uh, sort of having read through some of the data stuff specifically, that a lot of what even remote organizations rely on organizational and institutional like know-how, it's all sort of written out really intentionally in, in the GitLab handbook in a way that I think, especially for new people, must just be so nice. Um, we're still in the process of onboarding our latest person in, in some ways. And it's, there are so many moments that I will be, I'll be, I'll be speaking with her and I'll think, Right. Like I'm, all I'm doing is explaining to you something that I know just in virtue of having been here. And the fact that that's not somewhere for you to read and sort of ingest, like is a problem. I, I just want to say like, that still happens. <laughs> it, it still happens. It, it try as we might, because you never know what's not written down yeah, and yeah. goes to look for it and they don't find the answer. Um, and so even after I moved out of the data team, there were things where people would come to me with a question and rather than reply, I would then make the merge request, which is how we update the handbook and send them a link to the merge request and say, oh, like, nice. Does this answer your question. And if not, let me know and I'll, I'll make this MR better. Um, and that's actually kind of the story of the handbook and how it came to be. Our CEO, Sid C. Grandy says that, you know, people would ask him the question and he would respond and then people would ask it again and he doesn't want to repeat himself. So that's where the handbook came from. Um, and I think that that's true. And, and when that's the mindset, like I think about setting future Emily up for success a lot. And so I updated the handbook about the board meeting, not necessarily because the docs need to be better. I mean, they're mostly good now, but really I don't want to have to ask the question again next time. Right. And that's where like the handbook is an ever living, constantly changing document that, um, has so much of how we run the company, but changes are incredibly fast. Like you can open an MR in the morning at the beginning of your day, 9 a.m., whatever time zone you're in. And at five o'clock, it might be 3000 commits behind. Wow. So the handbook is changing so quickly. I wish I knew how many MRs get merged a day, but um, it's definitely something to keep up with. And one of the problems we're having now is like how much knowledge do people have to know and how do we make sure people are informed on the changes they need to be informed on? And uh, for a long time, I read the title of every merge request that got merged into the handbook. Wow. And then that wasn't sustainable anymore. So I read it only for the pages that were relevant to my interests. And then that's not sustainable anymore. And so twice a week now I skim the headlines. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hope that I catch the things that I need to catch. Yeah, I'm jealous. Uh, I'm jealous of the like just the culture of like a deep commitment to. I mean, really, what it is is like sort of asynchronous communication, right? Totally. And and I think um, 
like when we think about a handbook or we think about a process like that, that's what we're really talking about, right? It's like how, sending messages to ourselves in the future. Yep. Um, the other piece of this that I think is super important to think about, but often is not, um, is I read a post that someone wrote about a 2X organization, which means if you're doubling every year, which a lot of hyper growth startups are doing or even faster, then the material that you're writing isn't even for the people at the company. It's for the people who are not at the company yet. Right. Because a year from now, half of the people at the company won't have been here when you wrote that thing. Wow. And it lets you be a lot more intentional about documentation and writing good notes and documenting decisions and all of that sort of thing. When you consider, I've now been at Zapier for two and a half years, 75% of the people at the company were not here when I wrote the first thing that I wrote to document. Wow. And so that material isn't for the people now, it's for all the people a year and two and three from now that can go back. And I am just so grateful to one of our first, I think our first data scientist who started at Zapier, I can go back and find material that he wrote three or four years ago that has some sort of cool conclusion that I don't have to go ask him about. I just can right. search for it in our async tool. We use a tool called async. It's our internal blog where we post results and things like that. Um, I can go look in async and find material that he published in 2016 before I started at the company and not have to rerun an experiment and not have to take his time now. So that's super powerful and one of the biggest opportunities, I think, for asynchronous communication like that. And I think yeah. a good place to start, like if you're thinking about how to build more of a culture around this, um, working in like issues or, or tickets and keeping those well documented, that's probably a good place to start. It's not yeah. a great organizational structure, but it can start building that culture of like writing things down. Why did you approach the problem this way? What was the outcome? Things like that. Our, something that, that has been kind of interesting to me that's happened I guess has always been happening, but I'm only observing it now, is we have a pretty strong culture of asynchronous communication as well on sort of internal boards. You know, it's, it's a WordPress theme we use called V2. Um, but, and, and for a long time, I think the assumption was, oh, like this is documentation, right? Like we're communicating in this way. It's searchable, like, okay, cool. Like, but, but the problem is there's so many, there's like two or three P2s per person in automatic now. Uh, all of our different projects and sort of different divisions or, or whatever else. And what ends up happening is you still need institutional knowledge in order to like effectively search that. So you have to be, know like, oh, well, in 2016, the team that was working on domain recommendations was called Kraken. So I need to like <laughs> search on the P2s, you know, and it, it becomes this sort of second order institutional knowledge, whereas sort of organizing it in a more intentional way, like as in the handbook, um, seems to me to be a better sort of end run around this sort of requirement. Yeah, I mean, even that gets hard though, right? Let's yeah. talk about the top KPIs for the company. Sales has some, marketing has some, the CEO has company-wide KPIs, product has KPIs. So where does that live? On a KPI page or on each of the functional groups? Right. These are hard questions and I don't think there's a right answer. I think there's like a, we're doing it this way for now and if it yeah. doesn't work, we'll change. Yep. The pattern of this conversation pretty much is me saying, I think GitLab is great. And then Emily saying, eh, 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 not so fast. No, I will say, I think breaks. GitLab is great. <laughs> like, I, yeah. I really enjoy working at GitLab. I think it's awesome. But we're doing things in a different way. And I, yeah. like, people struggle with that when they transition is that like, it's hard and different and weird. Like, yeah, well, I appreciate it. I mean, any organization really that's kind of out there because we're all sort of out there on the on the edge of like what it means to be like doing work. And, and yep. I really kind of, as you know, as the, you know, I still have that 13 year old like punk rock kid inside me, right? Like I still, I like to think of being a little bit odd and a little bit sort of doing things in an unusual way. Totally. And like sometimes that means it's not going to work, right? But sometimes it does work and it works in really cool ways. Um, yeah. And we're, we're coming up at the end of the time and I just want to sort of thank you both so much um, I really, really enjoyed the, our conversation. Didn't even get halfway through my questions, uh, which is a good sign. That's a good thing. That's, that's good to have that happen. Um, so sort of for folks watching later, like what is the easiest way for people to get in touch with you or to follow along with the work that you're doing personally? 
Uh, so I have a website, Emily Sherio. My first name spelled E M I L I E, uh, and then S C H A R I O. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm currently on a Twitter hiatus, but I'll be back quite soon. Uh, I'm in L O Slack and D B T Slack and Great Expectations Slack and the Data Slacks. Find me on the internet. All the Slack. What about you, Stephen? <laughs> yeah, uh, similar story. Website StephenLevin.co. And I also hang out in many, many Slacks. Uh, Locally Optimistic deserves a shout out. They're great. DBT deserves a shout out, especially from Emily and I. Uh, We both spent some time actually working with Fishtown directly, who are the developers of DBT. And so that was a really amazing short stint in my career that really um, increased my technical chops. And so Fishtown deserves a shout out too. DBT Slack. (laughs) That's right. And I also help run one chief of staff Slack. So if you are an inspiring or current or former chief of staff, you can find me on my website and get in touch for contact info for chief of staff Slack as well. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Thanks. Thanks. See ya.